Hello, everybody in the room. Thank you so much for being here. And everybody at home, what a treat. Um, this time last year, I was, as most of us were, sort of working in our kitchens, bedrooms, sometimes studies. Um, and I actually think I leapt off my seat when I heard that Ottiline was uh, taking over from the brilliant Mark Walport. I was so excited because I remembered Ottiline as being the leader of the Bioethics Council. And I knew, I hoped, that she'd bring that same sort of inclusive, creative culture to the whole of research. And um, I, I was right. Um, she already has. And I'm so glad we have uh, Odeline here today because ultimately I was hoping that all of the COGEX audience gets to learn a little bit more about this brilliant woman. So as Ollie rightly or wrongly said, Professor Dame Odeline Liza is the Chief Executive of UK Research and Innovation. She's responsible for a £8 billion a year research grant funding, and it's not an easy task, but mid-pandemic, you have taken to it with absolute aplomb. What do you think your younger self would think if they saw you now? <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's a, a tricky question. I I guess my family kind of ethos was very empowering. My, my parents were very, whatever you want to do, you can do it. So I, I, I've kind of followed that. Hmm. line followed my kind of motivations and my interests and um for me I guess always question one is how does that work and that kind of took me into biology I, my training is in developmental genetics which is a very exciting area it's about how you go from a, a single cell to a complex multicellular organism with all the bits in the right place at the right time doing the right thing and it's fundamentally then about building a collaborative whole organism with specialization in all the cell types, but working together to deliver something extraordinary more than the sum of the parts. And that thinking you can apply incredibly broadly and you yeah. can definitely apply it to the research and innovation system. And I'm um, very much relishing the, the challenge of doing just that. Yeah, it's a lovely way to think about it. And how do you go from sort of academic endeavor, which is often quite lonely through to managing seven and a half, almost seven and a half thousand people? <laughs> I, I guess I've always played the academic endeavor as, as a collaborative yes. effort. So I, I've never felt lonely. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the most exciting things really of working in academia is, is the diversity of people that you meet, mm -hmm. both in terms of your colleagues around you um, but also um, more more widely, um, the, the people who are making the whole university work also mm. have some wonderful um, skills and different perspectives. And the opportunity as you progress in your academic career to work with the stakeholders that are, are key mm. to that. So I, I, I spent a lot of time before moving into this job working in science policy more generally, meeting people in mm. business, in government. <clears throat> and, and so that diversity of perspectives I find mm. really exciting. And, and you mentioned the Nuffield Council on Bioethics. One of the things I've always enjoyed is, is working with people with very mm. different perspectives and backgrounds. Yeah. You really get this extraordinary added mm. value out of mm. those kinds of uh, setups. And so that, that's mm. something I've sort of been drawn to all the way mm. through my career. Yeah, that's a great place to start. Um, so you have this sort of ambitious goal, or the UK has an ambitious goal of ensuring that R&D reaches 2.4% of GDP by 2027. Yes. What's the plan? <laughs> <laughs> so um, for me, I mean, we obviously have a long and um, strong track record in research and in innovation. And so, you know, really excellent research base, really extraordinary innovative companies doing amazing things. I think the thing that we are most missing is connectivity. So the systems have kind of driven a lot of balkanization in, in the mm -hmm. academic career. The things that you're rewarded for are quite narrow and focused mm -hmm. and they, they, they're great for doing fantastic exciting mm -hmm. research, they are less good for building that really connected system yeah. that we need to make to get to the 2.4%. We have mm -hmm. to create a, a sort of whole set of what I would think of as positive feedback loops where yeah. investment drives innovation, drives investment in, in, in that cycle. And I think um, the incentives in the system that balkanize and the concept mm -hmm. of the system as essentially linear are both extremely unhelpful. 
So um, for me, the priorities are thinking hard about connectivity, how one organizes it so that people and ideas and the networks that go with those people mm. really move freely through the system between the different sectors, business, academia, policy, public engagement, and back mm. again, um, and create that properly joined up system with the, with the feedbacks that really drive that mm. um, to 2.4%. We need, we need the exciting yeah. work in academia. We need the, the really exciting entrepreneurs and we need them to talk to one another so that they can both help each other with yeah. varying goals. And of course we need all kinds of people in between. You know, we, that, that's classifying people as one thing. Mm. I think increasingly, most of us will be multiple things in our lives and that's really exciting yeah and being allowed to be multiple things yes I think is really important and it's it's not traditionally been something that's happened so one of the, the things that you've said which I love probably the most is uh, maybe second most is um <laughs> we've got to bring some fun back into this absolutely um and I think there's a there's a as you can imagine some fear from the people who aren't looking for fun <laughs> and some excitement for the people who are how how can you address those two pieces together? How do we bring everybody along on the journey? So um, I think fun fun is important. I think fun's mm. really important. But uh, uh, you can you can frame that different ways. I think yeah. fulfillment is also really important. Mm. And and for some people, fun is an inherent part of fulfillment. And for other people, it, yes. it's, it's other things. And so maybe maybe it's just building that more inclusive definition mm. that brings people along yeah fun meaning more things yeah. fun meaning fulfillment i like that um it, we definitely are starting to see a sort of um desire in ai specifically but i'm sure across other research for more braided careers for people to be able yes. to do di you know jump from different areas what are the some of the ways that you're encouraging that or, able, or thinking about encouraging that, that? Absolutely. I, I think that's critical. And there, there are a whole variety of different ways to do that. Mm. And um, I, I think um, really building it in right from the beginning is important. Yeah. So um, into the education system in to create that kind of more mm. empowered feel. I think there's a danger in our education system that it becomes you know, I, I, if you go with the classical education, mm. it's about drawing things out of people. We tend to think of it now as stuffing things into people. <laughs> and, and so so re, reframing that as, you know, like, as I said at the beginning, you, you can do you, you can do what you want to do. Mm. So and I think that's very, very freeing. Mm. And so building that in right from the beginning is important. And then creating the opportunities for people to move more straightforwardly all the way through the career path so um, you know things concrete things that UKRI can do are um, uh, various kinds of fellowships that support people mm. in, in making those transitions either long term or, or just short term kind of tasters mm. some of our PhD programs have embedded um, uh, internships outside right. academia as part of, of what mm. they do and that doesn't just mean industry that means policy or or public engagement or um, you know all kinds of things mm. people do on those programs so th there's, a, there's a whole range of things and it is because it's mm. a culture change issue you need that range of things that, mm. that both flag that it's possible and create the opportunities for people to do it in a way that is less threatening almost to their identity than, mm. than the than current systems yeah. tend to be. But also it's what you said about fulfillment, everyone will see it in a different way. Yep. Like there isn't a one size fit all way for, for doing this. It's going to be really interesting to see what works and what doesn't work. Absolutely. Um, and you're only almost a year in, so <laughs> I totally see that. And obviously the government's thinking about a new way of testing research, mm -hmm. the new bill for ARIA, for those of you who don't know, the Advanced uh, Research Innovation Agency, which is 800 million pounds a year uh, for five years, um, for high risk, high reward research. What are your hopes for ARIA? So I think um, ARIA is a really interesting experiment, if you see what I mean. Mm. I see it as uh, it needs to be agile, it needs to be really empowered to do unusual and different things. Mm. Um, so it, 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 in as much as it's funding experiments, it needs mm. itself to be experimental. Mm. And I think if it, if it doesn't really push the boundaries of how you support research, then it will mm. have, have failed. Mm. I think it inherently needs to be doing things that the, the mainstream system doesn't do. And that, uh, I think, in the long term, mm. always having something that's 
sort of surfing on the edge of the edge is really mm -hmm. important and but at the same time things that work then you can feed back into the the broader mm -hmm. system and and that can work my, i mean my job is really to create a, a high functioning system right right across the whole spectrum mm -hmm. and having that kind of out there experimental arm i think w will always be helpful yes I, I every time you say it, i really do see like the inside of a plant um <laughs> uh, thankfully because you have painted the picture so well how do you then make sure that, that functioning system is producing things that are useful responsible responsibly ethically now in a world where so much um especially with an artificial intelligence we're concerned about how do you make sure that, that sort of flower is i guess Absolutely. in the public good so i think so i mean ukri is a relatively new organization we're about mm. three years old now and we we are made up of of uh, nine pre-existing things mm. and i think the fact that we have been created now is exactly mm. a, a reflection of of the realization that research and innovation now is a, a much more holistic activity mm. than than it was to capture the benefits we have to bring together all that, that expertise we have to um have that foundational kind of uh, mm. discovery activity that's that's kind of wild and free mm. and happening but we have to have also the ways to bring people together in different permutations and combinations to catalyze that and to connect that to innovation to the opportunity to add value mm. and that's very much how i like to define innovation it's mm. where you you recognize a value proposition mm. and and draw in whatever you need to do to to create that value mm. and the the join up we have across research and innovation in terms of all of that extraordinary discovery expertise and the um, innovate uk and wider across the organization kind of business innovation mm. focus i think that's great and because it's embedded mm. with um, you know, the Economics and Social Science Research Council and the Arts and Humanities Research mm. Council, all of that broader expertise about how that interacts with with humanity, with mm. what it means to be human, I think, uh, give us the opportunity to do that in exactly a responsible, mm. ethical way that people are excited about and feel is is part of their mm part of who they are as well i think research and innovation has got to be something that's done with people not to people mm. and our current conceptualization of it is it's rather a sort of separate activity that you know wonderful things get kind of thrown over the lab wall into the world and th that wall has got to go that wall has got to go yeah and the other thing that's got to go the lone genius i mean when i was at school i generally thought that science was going to be a lonely act i even asked you at the beginning without even noticing i was saying it was it lonely yeah um but every word you've just said was connected it felt collegiate it felt like a team game yeah. like how do we get rid of that lone genius so feel? The, the lone genius is, is a real problem mm. it's quite deeply in our culture and it it does two things mm. one is it creates that exclusive that's i'm definitely not a lone genius i can't go and do that yeah. which is a big problem and it's worse almost if you are a lone genius if you if yeah. you've decided to step into that space mm. it means an awful lot of people doing research and innovation think they ought to be a lone genius <laughs> and they use the lone genius stereotype as their security blanket for the fact that research and innovation is fundamentally an insecure act yeah. by definition you have no idea where you're going and and reaching for i'm a lone genius so i'm going to brilliantly find my way out of this is an incredibly dangerous solution because in your heart of hearts you know you're not so yes. so then you're living with this permanent kind mm. of cognitive dissonance imposter syndrome thing where the thing that you're using to prop up your insecurity is fundamentally undermining your security so we, it's got to go yeah. it is super unhelpful and anyone whoever they are whatever they're doing can can look around them for help and mm. they will benefit from disagreement and from difference and from mm. all of those things mm. whereas our current research culture makes disagreement a problem somehow which is nuts yeah. it's like so, the opposite of fulfilling exactly exactly <laughs> like enjoying things alone is, is yeah. never the same yeah. so we should move so in about 15 minutes just to everyone in the room and hopefully those on the q a on the ipad i will let um some other people ask some questions um but for now i'm going to keep asking but please do get your questions ready um no i can just see a picture of myself oh no here they are <laughs> Excellent. Um, 
so I can see some coming in already. But let's um, let's talk about my favorite topic, artificial intelligence, set to change, as we've heard of last uh, day already, everything, but specifically also how research is done. Yep. How do you see the um, AI landscape playing out in your grand plans for the rest <laughs> of UKRI? Yes, yeah, so I think you're, you know, AI is going to change everything, and it's it's very exciting. Um, I guess that the sort of first wave in of mm. use of AI in research is mostly about replacing immensely boring things that people don't really want to do with the machine doing it for you, which is great. Yeah. In my previous life, um, uh, a lot of people in my research group spend a lot of time counting branches on plants. Oh, wow. um, it, it's very, very boring, very, yeah. very crucial to what we were doing. Yeah. Really difficult to design some kind of pattern recognition that was able to count oh. branches in a growing plant so, <laughs> so, you know, that was, would it, be... was it lonely or were you together counting the branches oh, we were, it was very team activity okay, and good. lots of helping each other out all okay. this stuff. so, so that was that. good but <laughs> but not really a, an excellent use of, or, of, of brilliant minds so, um, yeah. although I've got to say uh, you know that the getting that feeling mm. for the organism is really important which is another element we'll get onto in a minute yeah. so um so yeah replacing really boring tasks mm. terrific um the next step really is is to do, I suppose, with um, helping to spot relationships and correlations that you wouldn't necessarily have spotted otherwise. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so stopping you doing boring things, helping you to I mean, signposting you to exciting mm -hmm. things. And then the really interesting element is is, is the next step, yeah. um, because I think a lot of people, and certainly me, in terms of what motivated us to start in research mm -hmm. was a sort of and a real desire to understand how things work. It's, it's about personal mm. understanding. It's, it's the excitement of being able to figure out how a living organism works. It's right. just amazing. Mm. And um, so the notion of, of AI as doing the understanding for you mm. is not very appealing. Right. The notion of AI as a tool to help you with the understanding, mm. brilliant. And it, it, it at some level that gets that sort of sits at the nub of a, a kind of endless question about research and innovation which mm. is is the goal to be useful and solve problems for humanity which of course the answer is yes <laughs> or is the goal um to be exciting um and fulfilling to support the kind of creativity of humanity right. to which the answer is also yes, yes. <laughs> and so um uh, organizing it so that AI mm. is properly embedded into both of those activities, I think is really important. Mm. And it, it's a classic where we tend to think of either ors mm. and, and either ors are, are, are very unhelpful. Very unhelpful. And also I think um, sort of inhibit the, the creativity. Mm. Some, some parts of creativity we might need to inhibit. So obviously AI poses re existential risks at the Bioethics Council, you were dealing with existential risks. What are your thoughts on how we make sure collegiately that we avoid those risks? So, I, I mean, this gets back a little bit also to this um, absolute requirement for the wall mm. to come down. Yeah. I think a, another serious problem with that wall is the separation of those, mm. of, of, of that activity from the world at large and that creates anxiety as, mm. as to what's going on behind the wall will it be good will it be mm. bad so uh, the wall's got to come down we've got to uh, mm. really embed the entire endeavor the entire research and innovation endeavor as a collective cultural and economic mm. uh, act that brings everybody along mm. and if we do that and we do it well those questions arise as you go along they're almost woven into the fabric mm. of the research you do in the first place they're not right. I've discovered something oh goodness this is a bit scary let's ask some people how scared they are mm. they're um you know we all come together on the mm. discovery journey and continually along the process um you're you're checking that mm. the way this is developing how it's likely to be applied who benefits how are the risks distributed um, that kind of mm. uh, distributional justice for both risks and benefits um, it needs to be woven much more firmly into yeah. the, the fabric of, of what we're doing from yeah. the beginning I think it really does and advice for how we bring that wall down I mean there's a lot of people cheering at home I'm sure this audience would be cheering if I'd let them what do we do 
it's one of those culture change things that requires mm. one to do many, many different things. Yeah. So um, I think for this audience, one of the really exciting things I have found is that the concept of the, the researcher is scary and alien, mm. but the concept of an entrepreneur is somehow mm. much more inclusive. So, so kind of joining up that continuum, I think, is, is one thing to do, yes. to think about entrepreneurship through mm. the education system, as we talked about, um, as well as, mm. as research and innovation. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is to start you know, on the, the kind of shiny lab side of the wall and, mm. and work outwards. So I'm very keen that we recognize and reward um, in researchers a much wider range of, of contributions than we currently do. And also that we recognize and reward all the people that mm. work around them and with them. Um, all of those people are absolutely essential to the research endeavor from the mm. person on the reception to the you know, person washing the test tubes, all of those people mm. are, are, are doing something indispensable for the yeah. activity. And if all of those people feel included, mm. you start to spread the joy and, mm. and that's um, really exciting. Yeah. And, and then, you know, flipping it the other way around, how can we bring the concept of research and innovation into community organizations and so on, mm. a, a kind of evolution of citizen science to be you know to, to mm. fund things that genuinely start in places that are not where people think research and innovation happens and, and empower people mm. to become researchers and innovators whoever they are and wherever they yeah. are so uh, and, and hopefully those things meet in the middle yeah I found out yesterday from Lila at uh, the CEO of DeepMind that AlphaFold actually has a fold it citizen science community that has been there for years, yeah. well before AlphaFold you know, and Demis and the team had decided even to a approach this, I immediately went on this, you know, Fold It um, website and I was like, I'm going to sign up. Clearly, I, didn't, I personally didn't have the skills, but I sent it to friends. It's an amazing, this, once you kind of see the citizen science world, I know you have quite an interesting analogy for how we can foster more citizen science. Can you share with everybody? I'm trying to think desperately which one. The football one. You want me the football one? Yes. I, I, I have another really interesting citizen from, from the zoo, the Zooniverse, which is kind of the other side of the coin. So the yeah. Zooniverse is this brilliant citizen yeah. science platform that runs in Oxford that um, started on recognizing yes. galaxies because people are better at classifying them than anything else. Although I'm sure AI will take over. <laughs> <laughs> that happened just yet. This sounds and great. somebody did a study yeah. on how you motivate people to do citizen science. Right. And when you made it into a competition with narrow rules for winning, yeah. it completely demotivated and awful lot of people and and the and the the list of things that were demotivating are to my mind almost exactly the list of things that we've built into the research innovation system as a reward system right. and so we need to take so what was it like prizes money yeah and and you know one person who was the best and um valuing only a, a narrow set of things yes. um it, it was it was really cool anyway, yeah. yeah so there's Great. that well let's definitely we'll yes. find a link for that and share that with everyone um, and then um uh yeah what you were what I was talk about was about. football. Yeah. So uh, the the sort of democratization argument freaks a lot of people out mm. because um, partly because that identity of, of of scientists as an expert is important to yes. them, and and so they kind of are, are anxious about that. But mm. but then you say football. Football is something everybody's excited about. You can mm. kick a ball around in the park at the weekend. You can watch the match. All of those things, um, but there are, mm. you know, superstars doing a brilliant job, yeah. winning matches for your the nation. Yeah. So it, it covers that full range mm. of things. All kinds of people can get excited about it. It's very unthreatening, but it, it you, you can still be excellent yeah. and you can still just be um, enthused. And, yeah. and that range, I think, is really important yeah. to capture. Arlene told me this analogy maybe a few months ago, and I still use it when I think about like, oh, well, you know, maybe I'm just the person selling the T-shirts outside the stand or, you know, or commentating on the, you know, and that's lovely. Like I already start to think about myself feeling part of something. And I think if we can get more people to feel like that, surely, as you said, the wall will start to come, I hope so. come down. Uh, you know, the, 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 the other end of that analogy yeah. is that, you know, at the moment, research innovation is, is not football, it's polo. Yes. It's, you know, elite sport for a very small number of rich people right. who need to have very specialist facilities, and most people have no idea what it is. Yeah. And the people who, who, who are the best paid to be the best. So it's not even the right vibes. Yeah. I meant in polo, not on the same sides. <laughs> um, okay, so 
Re get ready. Can I see how many hands there are up in the room? Okay, excellent. Excellent, great. I'm going to come first, though, to Izzy and then uh, on my app, and then I will come around. Izzy uh, says, you have an eight billion pound budget. It's a lot of money. Within the fund, is there the idea of keeping some funds for unknown, unknown white spaces? What in your view could be in that white space? So it's a lot of money. It funds a lot of different things. And that yeah. diversity is really important. So mm. the goal is to foster a system, a properly connected system mm. that delivers. And there is absolutely mm. uh, uh, an option for white spaces. Uh, actually, a core element of what we do right across that base is so-called response mode funding. Right. So anybody can write in and mm. say, I want to do this. Mm. I mean, they have to write a grant application fill in boxes and things like that but <laughs> but that i want to do yeah. this that i've thought of yeah. is absolutely fundamental to yeah. everything that we do both in in the business sector and mm. in in the academic sector there there is a, a an interesting discussion about whether that space is sufficiently open mm. so um do we provide enough opportunities for people to uh to invite you know ask for money for their brilliant new thing where they can't quite see where it fits across mm. that current landscape can we create mm. a a much whiter space committee yeah <laughs> um so we're, we're certainly discussing that mm. but that totally open element mm. is is a kind of core aspect of the of the input and yeah. then of course we have more structured elements that are pointed at particular things and there's the infrastructure mm. that you absolutely have to have to be able to deliver those things mm. there's funding mechanisms that are focused on people mm. um, um because quite often it, it, you know it, it's that it's those really innovative people mm. and skills that you need to support so, and then there's you know research whole research institutes mm. focused on particular things so it's it's a portfolio the mm. entire thing is very much a portfolio management job mm. and that's a key part of the portfolio i agree yeah because it's interesting because the white space is so difficult to predict and i actually was just um chairing a panel earlier with nhsx and they were saying they wish that they had more license to to be able to test and fail and test and try and test and fail things before obviously mm. they get to production and i think it's a similar challenge for the researchers like how do you get into that white space how are you brave enough yeah and how do you put forward for grant funding knowing that you might not get the grant funding? Do you spend the time? Can you, can you, is there a way to bring that white space kind of upfront like earlier in people's careers? Um, I feel like I, I know Izzy and I feel like that's where her question was coming from. That's interesting. Um, I think, so I think that we, mm. I think we need the white space right across the whole yeah. piece. I, I, you know, the, the, the career, mm. you know, people, you know, time, on the whole does move forward so people do yeah. have something they might yes. call think of as an early career and they might think of as a late yeah. career but in the interest of braided careers i think we need mm. um micro careers um yes so so what early means mm. is interesting i'm very keen as we discussed earlier to have funding mechanisms that support people to make radical transitions of various yeah. kinds and that might be a a white space opportunity mm. but at the same time um you know this really open funding mm. call stuff is mm. is just the, the sort of bedrock of mm. of what we do yeah it's really exciting okay so we're going to come to robert first and then i'm going to come to caitlin and then this way around i actually don't know everyone's name it's really awkward sorry <laughs> uh robert Um, so the, the oh sorry I have to repeat the question. Um, the question was: Does the UK have a grand strategy? The UKRI have a grand strategy for developing AI. Yeah. So there's actually also uh, we're working very closely with government because there's a whole government strategy. Well, I got a bit confused. About. <laughs> it's like I've got one of those. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and Tabitha and the AI Council. Um, uh, but what I, I guess what I would say in that context, it, it maps exactly back onto what we've just been talking about. Mm. A, a key job of, of, of UKRI is to keep its finger on the pulse and its money in the hands of that, you know, kind of bubbly, creative research base that is driving these extraordinary innovations. You can't... Um, uh, kind of narrow your focus down on today's 
data and say, okay, therefore our strategy should be ABC. You have to have one that's flexible and, and completely up for massive disruption. So there's, there's, there's joining up that kind of crucible mm -hmm. with uh, coherent uh, approach to capturing the benefits of that right across the economy, right across the public sector, where there are, is this extraordinary transformative potential. So you have to join up that discovery base right through to diffusion into mm. the you know the furthest reaches of the economy and and the public sector and that that's actually something I, I feel quite passionately that UKRI has the opportunity to do for the first time mm. there is a national organization that has as its focus the the good of mm. the UK um, that connects all the bits um, it's quite a responsibility because of course the bits of <laughs> busy doing their own thing yeah. <laughs> but we nonetheless have eight billion pounds and mm. a lot of uh incentive levers and convening power mm. and catalysis opportunities that I, I you know my ambition is absolute to make that work really well and ai is a really good example of where mm. it needs to do that and as you said i think your ambition of making the parts more you know the whole more than the sum of the parts, I think is a really interesting thing um, with an AI specifically. Yeah. So um, for those of you at home and in the room who would like to feed into the national AI strategy, the AI Council has got a survey where we, with the help of the Alan Turing Institute, we're disseminating all of those um, pieces of feedback and then giving them to the Office for Artificial Intelligence who is writing that strategy with obviously uh, in collaboration with UKRI. So uh, that survey links should wing its way to you on Hopin. And for those of you, you can kind of Google it. Um, so let's come to Caitlin first, and then I'm gonna just, the man here with the um, Liberty face mask. That's a great question. And um, comes back to the fact that we have actually in some ways for quite good motives, I think, precisely with a sort of equality um, mindset uh, narrowed the way we assess people's abilities into too small a number of boxes. Mm. Um, it, it looks fair if you use A level results, for example, uh, in a way that it, it, it is harder if you're, you're trying to use a much wider range of things. But actually, I think what you hide is, is, is a massive unintended consequence of trying to make things fairer, which is to crush diversity. If you use a narrow range of criteria, you will get a narrow range of people. Mm. That you, it's obvious when you think about it that way. Um, and so we need to step back and give ourselves permission to use a much wider range of of indicators of of um, the people's potential and their um, uh, options to contribute. We need to create those much more flexible career paths so that people can find their pathway mm -hmm. in, into the, the roles that they find most fulfilling. And crucially, along all of this, to do all of that well, we need to find really good ways to make decisions collectively. Mm. At the, at the nub of a lot of this is, is the difficulty people have um, balancing different sorts of data to make an integrated decision. And actually the solution to that is to have that diverse set of people mm. contributing to the decision in a context where they properly listen to each other and the leadership is very high quality to ensure that listening happens. There's really good research on how you get better decisions from diverse groups that listen to each other. Mm. And, and so we can do that. And there's really good evidence for how to do that. Um, we just have to have the courage of our convictions as researchers to follow the evidence. Mm. Yeah. Um, Neville. So I, I would argue that tearing down the walls precisely um, uh, mitigates stem cell type pressures. Mm. If you have, if you have that much more engaged conversation right from the beginning, you're less likely to wind up in a situation where um, suddenly there is an application that um, looks new and scary, and people mm. don't feel connected to the work that's that's underpinned that. Uh, it, in my experience, dealing with you know, I spent a long time with things like the 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 GM debate uh, we need uh, the issues around technology acceptance are, are much more heavily embedded in in anxiety about people's motives 
And in that landscape of who takes the risks and who takes the benefits, mm. then they are usually in the technologies themselves. There will always be people who have problems with particular technologies, ethical problems with particular technologies. But um, having those high quality conversations with society more generally, I mean, it's not even with society, it's just the entire thing happening as part of society, I think gets one to a position where that sudden conflict where people don't feel like they've had the conversation about who's benefiting and who's taking the risks and how that mm. technology should be deployed in our culture. That that's so I, taking down the walls I see is a key part of the solution. Um, in, in terms of of, of profit, uh, you know, we all know that the benefits from research are much more to do. Much, I mean, much they're not only to do with value added in pounds. There are all kinds of mm. other values that. Um, that research and innovation can add. And again, making that much more explicit, I think is a, is a key part of that ongoing conversation. Mm. Um, we're gonna take one from Sharif and then the lady here. Um, then I'm gonna take one from you gentlemen and then you, and I'm gonna take them together. I'll repeat them and try desperately to make it a little bit easier for Arteline to say them all at one time. You know, let's take those two first and then we'll come to the others. So de-risking, de -risking, climate and Absolutely crucial. And a, a key a key role for publicly funded research is, is precisely to, to de-risk so that the private sector can step in across those um, kind of gaps. And uh, so, you know, example that um, one can point out are things like the catapult centres that are funded through at least partly through Innovate UK, um, that, that explicitly aim to de-risk where there is a clear kind of out, out, clear mm -hmm. journey out the other side. And so, you know, national demonstrator facilities, all of those kinds of things. So I, I completely agree with you, de-risking is, is critical. And then clear, consistent government policies for things. One of the exciting things about Net Zero is it is an, a clear political resolve. It's it's a 2050 deadline and so it is making government think long term mm. and that's a really fantastic opportunity to embed that way of thinking across the research and innovation system more generally because the time frames in research and innovation are so complicated there's this really rapid massive disruption stuff that you have to be able to take into consideration but unless you have a really clear idea of where you're going what the goals you're trying to achieve it's much harder to absorb that exciting innovation you know like a new way to make concrete or whatever mm. um, and so bringing those things together fantastic opportunity net zero brilliant kind of trailblazer for that mm. um, publication yes <laughs> this is you know exactly one of the those narrow success criteria that we have um, knitted so deeply into the research system that is now causing us all kinds of problems so uh, of course you need to make your work public and available because otherwise um, no one will be able to see it <laughs> um, but uh, and there are all kinds of exciting ways to do that now and of course it needs to be subject to scrutiny by all kinds of people but uh, uh, the the situation where the work doesn't get out until it's been through peer review and the peer review is becoming more and more tricky for all kinds of reasons it is definitely not working especially in the context where researchers are rewarded for fancy public i mean there's there's sort of strange you know badging of publications of different sorts mm. uh, it, it's just it, it's very very unhelpful and it is very undermining for the kind of research culture that we need mm. so we need to broaden those criteria that we're using to assess researchers so that and it, it it's beginning to happen but it, it's one of those things that we need to get those positive feedback loops going so that people are confident that their publication on archive will contribute to their um, the next thing that they want to do sufficiently mm. that they can um, use that as their stepping stone rather than spend a huge amount of time shepherding something through a peer review system that is um, you know providing valuable input don't get me wrong uh, you know some of the most objectionable mm. peer reviewers i've ever had to deal with on my papers i have to admit have helped <laughs> but nonetheless um it, it can't slow things down and it can't constrain that creativity that we need so it, it's something we definitely need to fix yeah i'm gutted to say that we have reached time um but 
the future does feel very bright, Rosaline, <laughs> in this in this seat and at the helm of UKRI. So I'm just going to thank you all for being here today, and thank you all wherever you are. Um, and I hope to see everyone soon. Thank you very much, Rosaline. Thank you. Thank you.